I would like to start with a question. Don't know how many of you here are like product people or developers or, or more like teachers, educators. Who are here is a, like a developer. Developers? Okay, designers? Okay, but like content designers or, okay. Okay, so uh, let's ask, uh, let's, uh, let's answer this question first. How are design decisions made in an open project uh, product, like Moodle, like other projects? Uh, is it like this, isn't it? Like you have like these beautiful people, this diverse cast of people making really smart decisions. They have their, co their Starbucks coffee in here, uh, the last generation laptops, yes. Uh, I would say no, most of the cases it's not. It's more something like this. It's like <laughs> someone on, like, on, on his or her like Commodore 64 making decisions. So this guy here, let's call him Commodore Joe, something like this. Uh, he or she does their best to achieve good UX. They, they try, they used to try. Uh, but however, they. Usually they follow their own UI patterns, so it's I think it's a common thing. Like, should I place this button to the to the right, to the left? Like, the decisions are made uh, following their own instincts, and they often they, they design the solution around technical constraints. So, does anyone here feel like uh, related to this person? Have you ever been on this position? Have you ever? had to make this kind of UX decisions and made your best to do that? Yeah? Okay, first of all, a round of applause for those who try to, <laughs> to do their best UX. Thank you very much from Muro HQ. I really appreciate that. So, uh, well, first of all, I was forgetting, I'm Rafael Lechugo. I work on Muro HQ for six years now, Emilio. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, I, I used to work as a designer not in an open source project before, so I definitely felt the difference when you start making decisions in an open source environment, how that really you have to change your mindset to, to adapt to that. So I'll share with you guys some maybe thoughts that I had in this past like six years working in this environment. So can you guys tell me uh, this door here do you guys think we should uh, push it or pull it to open? Okay, I don't know the correct answer, to be honest, because it's an image I got from the internet, so it's not an important thing here. Um, the important thing is that uh, every time I see a door like this, every, every time, and it's happening a lot on this building, actually, that you don't know if you should push or, or pull it, every time I remember of open source software, because uh, they are like democratic dem uh, decisions. I, I think that doors are like really democratic. Everyone decides which way they should open. And so we as users, we have a hard time using doors most of the time. Uh, there is a designer that I respect a lot. I don't know if you guys know, it's called Don Norman. He published a book that I really encourage you guys to read. It's called uh, uh, Design of Everyday Things. He used to work at Apple. Uh, so. And he talks about these doors on, on his book, actually. And nowadays, these doors I know as Norman doors when, when this happens. Because good design should be simple enough and self-explanatory enough like for you to use it without any visual guidance. For example, these doors, we could have some signs. That happens a lot. And it's good enough. I mean, it doesn't take much. But for example, we have like this beautiful Japanese mug in here, which have like centuries this design have been perfected. And it would be really a shame if we have to add some visual aids to it, like, oh no, please, let's keep it like self-explanatory enough. So uh, simple design is always a good pursuit because, uh, because well, it makes more self-explanatory, users can use it better. So, okay, at this point, let's just make everything simpler. It should be simple enough, isn't it? Uh, I have a video here that I'm not going to display because uh, I have a GIF here that illustrates, yeah, so we don't. It's uh, 
if you guys want to look for this video, I think it's very interesting. It's a chimpanzee uh, using Instagram. And so Instagram achieved this so simple design that even a chimpanzee can use it. And actually, fun, funny story, I had a teacher on university that said that I should design for monkeys. Like it's something that if, you, if you're able to, uh, I was, I'm, I'm talking about the 2000s, there were no uh, applications at that point. But I think he made this, his point clear to me when I saw this video like 20 years later. Uh, so we all want to be like this, uh, the next, uh, the next uh, Netflix of something. We are, we are all selling, oh, this, the next Netflix of education. You're just getting here and you learn this. You, but is it that simple to, is that, is that easy to achieve this, this level of simplicity? Uh, this other author that I like a lot, I also encourage you guys to look for him. He's called Joe Maeda. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying the, his, his name correctly. He's an MIT teacher and has this book called uh, Laws of Simplicity that I like a lot. It's a very short uh, bo uh, book with 10 laws, which I won't uh, explain here because I don't think enough, I have enough time. And so the book is divided on 10 simple rules that uh, will help you make simple designs. I really uh, believe in these rules, but the one that I want to center here uh, is this one, which is which says that uh, some things can never be made simple. And it's like, according to this author, is one, one law of the simplicity. And it makes really think about Moodle and some solutions cannot be as simple as uh, ordering food. Uh, or, or something like that. Uh, you have to you have to grade. You have to teach different things. You have to work with different media. This this dream of achieving like this Netflix solution uh, for education. I mean, let's get real. But doesn't mean that we cannot try because when we try, we uh, one of the things that this uh, law thing talks about is that even if you fail trying to simplify things, we we'll, we will learn from that process. So. This is a good thing that you, you, you get with you. And you can also come with processes to manage this complexity even if you cannot deal uh, with this complexity at that moment. Uh, I'll rush a little bit because I think I crammed too much information here. Uh, this is another uh, graph that illustrates, um, maybe you guys already saw this somewhere else. Uh, this kind of explains the magic process of designing simple stuff. Uh, in this side, we have uh, an informant simplicity. So I have this drawing here, this uh, the uh, Victor Son. Uh, you guys can see very well because there is a, a lighting. Let me see if I can, no. So yeah, I think this is like the, the, the word uh, through the eyes of uh, children, for example, children or a kid. It's very simple, uh, like simplicity is here because uh, the word is simple, nature is simple. However, as we, and now I'm being metaphorical. We grow up, we, we, we learn how to deal with complexity in life, and at some point we could end up being like a, a Mondrian or, and come with some, which seems like simple art, but uh, the thing is that an artist like Mondrian can, can afford to be simple. He, he chooses to be simple because uh, he or she can be simple. So what happens in here? So again, we're, we're looking for simplicity. Well, so let's just make everything simpler. Uh, wait a second. Well, I think this slide will be very hard to, to see. Sorry? Oh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, now I feel like I was getting blind with the lights, like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Gracias, gracias. Uh, so I talk about with my uh, with my colleague Emilio about uh, complexity transfer. Uh, so this is the way I th I see things lately. Uh, we have a product team here, and right now I'm jumping more into like a corporate space. But uh, uh, keep keep uh, with me. And then here we have the end user. So the thing is that we can deal with the complexity on our work here. The product team could be doing research, discovery, designing, testing, iterating, developing, refactoring, dealing with technical debt, 
and quality assurance, documentation, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of work on a product team. And if they deal with this complexity, they will probably, not always, but probably will ship, ship a, a simple solution. And the other way around is also, is also true. If, if we don't have a product team or a product team doesn't deal with, uh, with the, the complexity they have in their hands, they probably will end up shipping a, a, a complex solution for the end user. A product with too many settings that doesn't tackle the correct pain points, uh, a clutter UI, a clutter experience, uh, slow, buggy, uh, uh, and emotional. So, okay, so let's, the uh, question here is who, who, who makes these decisions? Why don't we just always do this? Uh, I named this figure here a stakeholder. Uh, I couldn't think about a better name. If you guys can think about, uh, I'm open to, to ideas. So I call stakeholder someone who's making these decisions, not exactly our boss or something above us, but at some point in our lives, we, have, we had to kind of decide between these two. And it's not like a, a binary thing, like we have to choose between one or not, but uh, if we could leave this room having this, uh, this understanding that how the, the, the amount of complexity we try to deal here will, will help the user to not have to deal with. Uh, so every decision that we make uh, on the on the design process, someone will have to deal with this complexity uh, one uh, one time uh, in one point or another of, of the process. So, uh, does anyone here feel like recognized on this role here? Does everyone also had to make like this kind of decisions, Emilio? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, th these are not easy decisions to make. Uh, I, I I won't get to this point with you because I, I honestly don't know. This is, this is like really business decisions because the stakeholder here have to deal with the resources that they have, uh, time to to market, uh, strategy, business business strategy, etc., 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 etc. So I won't provide an answer here. I just want to leave you guys a, a reflection of what why some products are simpler than that and what can we do. Uh, to mitigate this. But what happens with uh, contributors or, or Commodore Joe? Because he doesn't have a product team uh, behind him. He probably doesn't have the resources to, to, to deal with this uh, complexity. Uh, I can bring some tips and some, uh, honestly, we have a dramatic transition here. Yay. So, I can give you guys some kind of tips, things that I learned uh, to kind of try to make the product more consistent, more future-proof, uh, and try to do what to do with this complexity. So the first one, uh, I really encourage you guys to run user testing, even, uh, well, because user testing will help you take the correct decisions. Even if you don't have a perfect product to, to ship at that moment, let's say, uh, if. It, well, if, if it's failing like 100%, you probably should go back to design phase and, and rethink your, your product. But sometimes we don't have 100% uh, success on, on, on this testing. But do you discover a lot about it? You, you discover what, what where the problems are and maybe you can tackle later these problems. But uh, the biggest mistake here is being ignorant about your product and not know what you're shipping, where the problems are, where, where the complexity is. So I really encourage you guys to run some user testing. If, if you have a product team to do that, it's much better. But if you don't do, I encourage you to still do some like a guerrilla user testing, like your mother, your friends, your, your partner, uh, get them and just put them to test your, your solution. Don't do it very often though, because it happens to me in the past, like getting, I don't know, my mom to do a, a user test and then one week later you do it again and they already have some bias, uh, uh, so they already learn how to do that. So try to get always fresh meat, uh, fresh meat to 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 do that, and and even still, it, it's hard to not be biased when you do this user testing. I mean, I have the lucky to have like a, a whole research team dedicated to to do this on Moodle HQ because it's an art form. It's an art form. I, I learn a lot from them day by day. Uh, how easy is for you to bias yourself and, and try to get this answer that you really want to get, you know, because it's easy for us as designers to fall in love with our solution and say, this is great. 
So if you don't do the right, uh, uh, the, the correct uh, questions, you, maybe you could be biasing the results. So it's not easy to do, but still better than not doing it. I think this is like my point. Uh, from an architecture perspective, we can also uh, help to, to simplify things. So I think this is very much Moodle related uh, because I think that uh, Moodle, uh, especially on its beginnings like 20 years ago, was really, really a, a work of love from Martin and the early community. So there were no, as, as far as I know, I don't think there were any, almost any designers around at the time. So mo most of all of the features would end up landing on Moodle at that point. So, but nowadays we can ask ourselves, uh, this thing that we are developing, each, either on Moodle HQ or in the community, should it land in Moodle? You know what I mean? Because uh, I don't have uh, numbers for this, but I, th I think in my opinion that if your feature just affect like, uh, I don't know, 20% of uh, the total uh, user base, maybe could be an external plugin to be installed only for this and it shouldn't be landing on, on Moodle and adding more complexity and more things for users to learn how to, to use. So. I think this is the first question that we should do. Should we really merge this solution into the product itself or should it be on the, on the plugin directory, uh, et cetera, et cetera? This is also a very Moodle, Moodle uh, heavy one, in my opinion. Uh, sometimes we, we make plugins, new functionalities that, uh, that change the behavior of the product a little bit. Let's take, for example, uh, the block drawer. Uh, so should it be open by default or should it be closed by default? Yeah, some, some, yeah, sometimes we need to answer these questions when we, sh we, we ship our solution. And it's very easy to just turn that into, into a setting. You know, we, I don't know what to do, so let the user choose if they want to be open or closed by default. However, again, this is like the, the, you're transferring the complexity for the end users because we don't want to do the research ourselves because maybe if we, we spend the time to research that, we'll find out that 90% of the users want this behavior. And so I, I'm sorry about the other 10%. But, but uh, it's important to add settings only when you see that both scenarios are beneficial for users and it's important to spend time discovering uh, if this is true or not. Uh, so this is exactly what I just said. If we add a setting, we are adding complexity for the user. If we want to find the, 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 the behavior, we are adding complexity to our team. Uh, Components, and this is the last, this is the last uh, part of the presentation. So thinking about our components also can help make things more simple, more future-proof. When you are designing your plugin, many times you have to some drop-down menu or some buttons or some dialogue. Uh, should you create them from scratch or should you reuse some existing ones? Uh, I always encourage you guys to uh, try to use existing ones. We have the component library, which is kind of, uh, it's not outdated, but it was this initiative like to have all the components listed there. And we're trying to have the community also helping us to document of all the components in Moodle. So is it there? Uh, if, you, if the component you're looking for is not on the component library, it doesn't mean that doesn't exist in Moodle. I, I, I would still like review a little bit uh, pages that we know, and maybe you'll find this kind of drop-down in there, this kind of button with a drop-down, and you can reuse this component, and that will make your, your plugin much more future-proof, because when that's updated in Moodle, automatically it's updated in your, in your plugin as well. If you don't find this component in Moodle, I encourage you guys to use Bootstrap instead. Go to bootstrap.org, I think it is, their page and you have a huge array of buttons, menus, dialogues, and everything, all of these are already in Moodle because every time a, a page is lo loaded in Moodle, all the bootstrap components basically, all the styling are, is already there. So it's just a matter of using it. And the last option, in my opinion, would you to be to design a new component from scratch because that will, you will need to man maintain, will be harder to maintain it over time, we'll probably well, and, and, and this, this connection between Moodle and your plugin will start to make things more complex for, for the end user. We'll start to make, create this friction on the experience. Uh, this is just a, a silly thing. If you're creating a new component, you also have to ask yourself, uh, uh, should, should I, five minutes? No, I have enough time then. <laughs> uh, 
you should ask yourself, should I, this component be on the plugin directory itself? Or maybe I have some bundle of plugins, a set of plugins, and so I want to move this component to the to have an external theme and have everything packed together. Highly technical, very boring. No, not going to follow that way. So let's uh, recap, and I think it will be perfect in time. Uh, open source is uh, often uh, is a lot of work made by a lot of people. Uh, they, they're trying the best they can to do good UX. It's very democratic, and I think that's its, uh, it's, its strength. Uh, the open source uh, strength is its democratic nature. However, when it comes to design decision making, as we, we thought about these doors, uh, democratic decisions sometimes can, can help creating this, this friction. Uh, everybody wants to be the, net, the next Netflix of something. Uh, it's, uh, although I think lately with AI, this, this trend is kind of cooling down a little bit, and uh, now everyone wants to be the AI something of something. Uh, and some solutions can never be made simple. Uh, no shame on that. Things are, uh, the things are how they are. Uh, it's also good, always good to spend time trying to make things simple. Uh, if, you, if you can't reach the simplicity because you, you will learn in the process, you will learn where your product is complex. Uh, stakeholders some, not can always spend their resources on making everything simple. Uh, I'm pretty sure they wish they could but sometimes we have to prioritize other things on the design process, so we try to make as simple as we can. Uh, so, yeah, someone will, will deal with the complexity in the end of the day. If, 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 if it's, it's in us, uh, it will be the, the end user. And the, the community developer, is having, is, uh, he or she has uh, even a harder time dealing with this complexity due to the lack of a product team behind. Some good practices uh, will be uh, running user testing uh, any time you can, and make smart architectural dis uh, decisions, merge it or move into external plugging, user setting or a default behavior, and finally, uh, reuse native components as much as possible. There are so much m more things. I, I had more stuff in this presentation. I had to start cutting corners due to the lack of, of time. But if you guys have any questions, uh, now is the time. If, if, if we don't have time or you don't have any questions now, if you guys see me on the, here on the venue, uh, please let's talk about design because I'll be very happy uh, to do that. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering, you're using Bootstrap a lot, but do you plan in the future to have your own design system for Moodle? Okay, yeah, one of the, one of the slides that I, uh, the topics that I removed from here was about design systems, exactly, so thanks for the question. Uh, well, I have my own personal thoughts about on design systems. I think they are great uh, for every product. Everybody loves to come with a design system. It's very fun, very engaging to design, designing the borders, the colors. Is, uh, but then I saw a lot of times in the past, like two years from now, four years from now, the design system get kind of outdated or lost. It's, it's not like synchronized with the product anymore. So I think design, uh, design systems are great. However, they, they require uh, some team behind it, in my opinion. I, it's not, and I, I think it's not like one person job to, to keep this. Uh, you, you, you can even go further and try to use design tokens to have everything uh, aligned all the time. But again, it's a, it's a considerable amount of resources that you spend on that. And in Moodle, we try to do as much as we can using the component library and, and Bootstrap. The component library was some kind of uh, attempt to have everything together, uh, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. But. Yeah, totally. It's just because I see Moodle like a bit like an Apple or Google. So they have the design system. So all the applications follow the same language. And sometimes in Moodle, I feel the plugin don't follow the same language of Moodle. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, design language go be goes beyond uh, uh, a design system. Uh, but the way I see it, uh, at least Moodle is very bootstrap uh, based because um, I think we will have an, a big 
even market opportunity for themes, uh, for uh, partners to design their solution, for uh, you guys to to personalize your school using CSS, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think that Moodle, sh in my opinion, but I, I can be wrong, I, I'm open to discussion. I don't think it should have like a really strong design language out of the box because of this, uh, this personalization, because uh, uh, a children's a school, elementary school, a high-end education, they have very different uh, design language. And, and I really believe that Bootstrap is like a, a common ground for all of them. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, would you say that Moodle is more uh, a framework where people can lean on just what you were saying, or would it be a finalized product that one can install and use? Because I, my personal opinion, I, those two settings make it really hard for someone in your position. So I would like to, to understand your, your yeah. thoughts on that. Well, it kind of goes back to the democratic decisions that uh, I had to face when I moved to an open source environment, because uh, we, we are very democratic in Moodle itself. It's part of the company ethos. So uh, we have this uh, UX huddle, UX chapter on the company, so kind of everyone can jump in on decisions. Uh, and we also talk to the community a lot, and we have to kind of make some decisions feeling how the community feel about it and listening to them. So. I can say I can speak for myself, but not for for the whole company. I I, I see Moodle as more as a framework than a, than a product, uh, uh, but out of the box. I mean, we, we we try to have an experience out of the box, very much straightforward. We we think a lot what would be like the, the default dashboard, the default uh, behavior of the page trying to trying to be as common as impossible, like for every use case, but I think Moodle more more like a, a framework, as I say. Also, I'm I'm very biased on that because I'm from Moodle Workplace team, and Moodle Workplace team works really close to the partners' uh, solution created. So, having the partners adding this layer of services uh, around Moodle is something that is something that I really deal with. I deal with that on a daily basis. Yeah, thank you.